Aloha, and welcome to the latest edition of Telehealth in Hawaii. I'm your host, Vikram Acharya. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Cloudwell Health, an all-virtual telemedicine provider based in Hawaii. We have a great show for you today. I am very excited to introduce Mr. John Williams. John is the Chief Executive Officer of the Hanaho Medical Group here in Hawaii. John, how are you doing today? Hey, Vikram. Doing good. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being on. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you. To kick things off, John, tell me a little bit about your background. You're a healthcare administrator. You're the CEO of a medical group. Uh, tell me a little bit about what got you into healthcare. Sure. I, I'll uh, g- give you, hopefully, just the, the two-minute version. I, I think I've gotten it down to two minutes. Okay. Um, so I originally trained as a, a clinical pharmacist. Um uh, Came out of uh, UCSF, God, I can't even think the right number of years. I think 40, no, not 40, 35 years ago. So I got trained out of UC, um, practiced pharmacy, uh, majority of my career at uh, Kaiser Permanente. Um, And then about uh, 15 years ago, I uh, transitioned over, was the chief operating officer for a uh, federally qualified health center uh, in California, San Francisco. And then uh, eight years, 10 years previous to this, um, transitioned again, uh, became the CEO for a, an IP, a legacy IPA medical group uh, in San Francisco, Chinatown. And then uh, most recently, my, my gig is here with uh, Hanaho Medical Group. So you um, have made a transition from being a clinical pharmacist, really kind of involved in the day-to-day aspects of patient care to more of an administrative role, it sounds like. What, what made you want to make that type of transition? Uh, it's a, I mean, a little bit of a cliched answer, Vikram. You know, a lot of people say that to, to be able to, to impact more lives, uh, you know, have more influence on, on systems, um, understanding where healthcare was heading, but it was sort of a, for me, it was a, you know, natural progression. Um, you know, how individuals, um, maybe not everybody, but myself, you know, you're like, oh, you know, you should do this or you can improve that. And, and you end up signing with just like you're complaining about stuff. And so instead of doing that, uh, with each step in my career, uh, I took a step up, so to speak, and then tried to improve what I thought I could improve. And it just almost naturally led me here. It was never a, a goal of mine uh, to, to become a CEO or, you know, or CEO in a healthcare space. It was yeah. just sort of a natural pro- progression with them. Interesting. Okay. That's great. Now you're in charge of the Hanaho Medical Group. What exactly is the Hanaho Medical Group? Yeah. So uh, it, in Hawaii, uh, we are in, in Hawaii language, we're a uh, a medical group, uh, which uh, quali- which stands as a risk-bearing entity, uh, and what that means is that we uh, engage payers, whether they be direct payers um, like Medicare or um, plans or health plans, to engage in risk-bearing contracts where we partner with health plans uh, to provide services uh, to their beneficiaries, whether it's Medicare, commercial or even uh, Medicaid or MedQuest here in Hawaii. Hmm. Um, We are uh, a physician-based organization. So there's physician governance, uh, physician committees. Um, We are physician-centric with the belief in terms of, you know, maybe I should have started off this way. I'm not very good with uh, promoting my own organization sometimes. But, uh, you know, our our vision and our mission really is to uh, sustain and grow independent community practices uh, or physicians, if you want to call them that. There's been a trend um, both at a local and national level where, where that number has been decreasing over time. Uh, but we think uh, community physicians play a, a, a very valuable and critical role in healthcare delivery, not only in Hawaii, but, but everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting uh, theme. You mentioned the importance of the independent physician, independent community physician. Uh, what was the thinking behind setting up an organization like Hanaho? How did you go about organizing the pieces? Because it's, it's very complex, you know, the space, yeah. and very critical. 
uh, what type of planning was involved to to put it all together? Uh, fortunately for me, you know, I had the opportunity um, to work with uh, the IPA and medical group uh, in California and in managed care and uh, in California, they call them RBOs or risk pairing organizations. Those structures are, are relatively common um, and it's it more established. They, they never, it caught on in the eighties and it sort of stuck. Uh, there may have been groups that had, you know, sort of either uh, consolidated, uh, some of them sort of, you know, weren't successful, but the ones that, that stuck around, uh, they have established structure. Uh, California itself is is a little bit more, what would be the right word, uh, rigid in terms of monitoring and, and uh, controlling sort of risk-bearing organizations or entities. Uh, they have a department called DMHC, Department of Managed Healthcare. Um, so I have experience in doing that. I understand what the structures are, how the operational flows are, how the financial risks are set up, how the contracts are set up, you know, what's needed to really be uh, a successful risk bearing entity. Now, when, when you call it that, it, it, it still links to, you know, the common terms about, you know, value based contracting and value uh, value based outcomes. So they're all interrelated in my mind. So we can talk about all those things. Yeah, yeah, that's a good segue for for someone who doesn't know what value based healthcare is. What are risk bearing entities? Uh, wh- how can you unpack that? For people who may not be familiar with the lingo and and uh, sure sure yeah I I get I get accused of using uh, way too many acronyms I think in healthcare we do <laughs> use a lot, a lot of acronyms ourselves anyways um, yeah. in in terms of of risk bearing so w- when you look at when people talk about healthcare uh, in the United States um, it's it's and in, in you talk about health plans and health systems um, it's still anchored by insurance, it's health insurance, is what, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, commercial private insurance, Medicare Advantage, it's, it's health insurance. Uh, and it used to be, and it's less so now, uh, most ins- health insurance companies uh, didn't provide the actual care, right? They don't deliver the care directly themselves. Uh, what they do is they engage, in, in our terminology, uh, uh, providers. Uh, of healthcare services, whether they be physician, non-physician, hospital-based, um, and used to be the, the the older model was it was very transactional, right? You provided a service, and, and someone paid you a, a contractual amount. Um, more recently, it's either you know the Medicare fee schedule or the Medicaid fee schedule. Um, in terms of of trying to get to uh, quality-based outcomes or, or outcomes that are, have been proven to show um, improvements in, in overall health, whether it's for a, a larger population or a community. Um, you know, health plans, uh, payers, uh, health systems started recognizing that there were, uh, you know, leading indicators or leading outcomes that downstream proved to be valuable to predict uh, whether a population remained healthy or stayed healthy, or whether you know they continued to deteriorate, uh, if if for example they didn't have access to really good healthcare services, uh, so slowly and it still exists. There's still a mix, uh, but slowly the, the trend is to moving towards some value based outcome where uh, entities, organizations you know, accept the responsibility, both clinical and financial, to take care of a population. Uh, typically, it's related to uh, health plan beneficiaries uh, that signed up for the health plan. Uh, and with that responsibility, um, you are given, uh, I don't know, I don't know how much, how, 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 at what level you want to have me use the terminology, uh, but they're given a, a, a capitation. The way I look at it is, is you're given an allowance, so to speak, and, and, and you have to provide the services associated with that capitation or finite amount of money, um, and you take risk on it. So in a, to really kind of unpack that, or these are organizations that you're a part of that take care of patients and measure based off how populations do from an outcome standpoint. So from taking care of them, uh, 
you'll get, let's say, for example, $100 from an insurance company. And within that amount of money, you have to take care of X amount of members. You have to stay on top of them, make sure that the preventive care is in place, that they're getting all the checkups they need. And there is some financial risk that you're taking by obtaining that $100 in a very simple example. Yeah, in, in in sort of straight numbers or easy numbers, I, I like that you used a hundred. It's easy to break down, but you know, that hundred dollars is what we call you know a capitation amount mm -hmm. uh, or a finite set of dollars associated with it. The the in there are camps who who support this methodology, and there are others who still believe you know the the older FIFA service model is still better or still valuable. Uh, and quite frankly, there's there's a mix of it uh, depending on type of providers. But the the data to date so far shows that under a capitated structure, uh, physicians, providers, systems who are uh, paid more based on quality um, mm -hmm. start focusing on you know outcomes that improve uh, both the quality of care. Uh, the quality of life um, for members. And when you focus on that, uh, it translates to um, not only better health outcomes, but it also translates into what, what Medicare, Medicaid also need is accessible, affordable healthcare services, mm -hmm. right? Where, you know, the, I, I don't know what the number is now, Vikram, and if it remained fee for service, like 100%, probably we'd be past like 20% of the GDP for healthcare by now. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I, I think it's still pushing up to 17. I don't remember the exact number, but it's still pretty high, still creeping up a little bit. Yeah. So you're getting paid for how patients do versus the more you do for patients. So taking care of them versus let's order this test and do this and this and this and then get paid for it which is a much more efficient quality-based model in terms of how you take care of people. Yeah, you know, when you look at the fee-for-service model, because it's transactional, it's, it's mm -hmm. really granular. And, right. and no one take, not no one, it's harder to take a step back and take a look at, at whether it's a, the total patient, uh, the total panel, the total community, uh, the total state, I think when you look at a population level, um, that's where you can see the the benefit of of having a, a reimbursement structure uh, linked to quality programs. You can see the benefit and the improvements that you see at a population level. It's harder to see, you know, when you talk to an individual physician whether it has a true impact. If his panel is like, you know, I don't know, twenty, fifty, even a hundred. It's harder for them to see, but when you step back and look at it at a population level, uh, or even at a national level, you do absolutely see the improvements associated with it. Definitely, definitely. Now you're uh, working with medical staff physicians across the entire state. Are there specific islands that you're focused on right now? Or what's what's the uh, trajectory looking like in terms of you know who you're working with as part of the medical group? Yeah, right now we work with uh, physicians on uh, all the islands, or put it another way, we don't exclude any any islands in terms of uh, engaging with physicians um, based on density of population, whether it's patients or, or physicians. Uh, the the bulk is in on the island of Oahu. There's a little bit Kauai, Big Island, Maui. Uh, I don't think on the smaller islands. Uh, I don't think we have a physician in Molokai, but yeah, there, there, there's no exclusion. Maybe to think of it that way. Yeah, well, that's great. Now, if you, when you're approaching the insurance companies on that end, uh, what types of information do you provide to them in terms of uh, who you are as an organization and what your goals are and how you can work with them? Yeah, the, the, the way we approach uh, health plans, uh, whether, you know, the, the plan, if you want to call them that, um, or the payer is Medicare or whether they're health plans, uh, the big, the larger health plans uh, in Hawaii, um, we present to them 
like I said earlier, as a medical group, first and foremost, or collective of physicians, uh, but the, the group um, as a risk-bearing entity in that we're willing to engage them as partners uh, for their uh, members and beneficiaries, which become um, our patients or the physician's patients. And we uh, provide the, I don't know, the, the, the bridge to, to the local community physicians. Instead of uh, health plans working with 100 individual physicians, they get to work with a medical group who is able to uh, coordinate programs, coordinate messaging, and then provide additional support to uh, the independent doctors. Yeah. I'm sure when you are having your discussions with the independent doctors, uh, there are some common themes in terms of what's important to them, uh, what they truly value. Uh, what are some of those things that come up when you're, when you're in your discussions with your current group, as well as in the process of obtaining uh, additional partners? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, and it's um, a fairly general term, Vikram, but but it 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 expands and touches a lot, right? You hear the word uh, transparency quite a bit, right? And transparency is is both with um, measurements, whether uh, they're outcomes based. Uh, transparency in in reimbursement uh, across the system, not just for themselves. Um, they mm -hmm. want to see. They want to be good stewards of uh, how the 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 medical dollar is spent, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and then, last but not least, uh, either however you want to call it, negatively administrative burden, positively, you know, support structures. You know, so how, how is the medical group? And what support services do they provide to independent practices? Um, yeah. Those are the three main themes that we run into most commonly with doctors. Mm -hmm. And what kind of uh, support services do you do you provide uh, for for your for your partners? Yeah. So one of the things that that we think is is unique is we uh, invest in in what we call member relations and provider relations. Member relations is the outward facing uh, with their patients. Uh, we help them with questions, with, with claims or bills. Uh, you know, sometimes the department even helps with non-healthcare stuff. Uh, quite frankly, because of the cultural competency that's required for some of the communities, uh, you know, when they can't get a hold of anybody uh, because they have a relationship with the member of relations, they'll ask them to figure out, you know, why is my electric bill this way? Or, you know, why is my telephone bill? But most of the times they're, Healthcare bills, whether it's co-pays, whether it's coverage, whether it's helping them uh, coordinate a, a referral with a specialist, or you know, prepare for uh, an outpatient visit um, to a hospital. Um, in terms of provider relations, it's the same thing. We do that at the provider and the provider staff level. You know, when they have questions about what's covered, you know, who's in network, who's not in network. You know, mm -hmm. I submitted a claim. Where is that? We provide more granular support. Uh, I think sometimes, um, you know, uh, to no fault of their own, uh, larger health systems uh, don't have the the boots on the ground, so to speak, locally to be able to provide that support. Uh, and in we do, and we provide it for our physicians because we know them well. There's a relationship, so things are a lot smoother and and easier that way. On the clinical side. Uh, We've started programs for um, care management, care coordination, and complex case management. Um, those are, and we can dig into that a little bit more, but you know, that's probably maybe another podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we also provide uh, you know, data and analytics down to the provider level, down to their panel and patient level as well. Uh, we, we, we chop it all up, reorganize it, present it to them, um, in a, a user interface uh, platform that's really easy for them to digest. Uh, we have, uh, and, and maybe you should talk to them one of these days, we have yes. a, a tech partner in, in Alation Health. Uh, mm -hmm. They're a technology company. Uh, their uh, main focus is electronic medical records, but they do also uh, a, what they call a, a tech stack, I guess, in, in their field, which is, you know, EW, analytics, reporting, uh, you know, clinical outcome, outcome support. So 
It's uh, we provide all that through the medical group, uh, and it's at uh, a very uh, individual, almost personal level for the physicians, and that's something that we think is valuable. Yeah, I mean that's a robust set of services, and not only provides significant value uh, to the practice, but it sounds like it because you're helping these practices so much, it allows the providers, the physicians to really focus on patient care. You know, they, they can do what they do, what they want to do, and knowing that they have this nice support structure behind them. We, the, the, it's, it's, when we, when we look at it, maybe we're, as a medical group, or maybe I am a little bit biased. It's like a win, win, win. It's a win for the patient because they get added support. It's a win for the doctors. They get additional support. And it's a, a win for the plans in that uh, we become the uh, intermediary, intermediary support structure that the physicians and their staff and the patients are very familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, with that transparency, it, it leads to an even more broader term, uh, I, I think. You know, transparency then leads to trust. And right. when you have trust, then you start getting engagement and participation. But that engagement and participation is not just with doctors, it's with patients and with doctors. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what are your thoughts, John, on, on an asset like uh, telehealth, for example? You know, it can help uh, support patient care. It can help uh, keep costs down, open up more access. What are your thoughts on, on something like telehealth? Yeah, I, I, I think telehealth, is uh, you know what everybody is saying, Bikram. It, it, it's it's here to stay. Uh, I think with the, the the pandemic in the last two years, um, it unfortunately you know unfortunately in that it, it required something like a pandemic to show it, but it was almost a proof of concept as to is there value to telehealth. There was incredible amounts of back and forth argument. Uh, no, it doesn't work well. No, patients aren't going to like it. No, you're going to kind of get uptake on it. Uh, no, it's not effective on outcome. Just on and on, just back and forth uh, pre-pandemic. However, the data, and I, I guess some people say data doesn't lie. You know, the data coming out of it is showing that actually it's the opposite of all the naysayers. From what I can read, I, I'm sure maybe someone pull up something. But in general, it's been proven to be extremely valuable, um, both in access and in clinical quality, uh, especially for those patients, and I'll call them patients, patients who have difficulty accessing services, sure. whether it's due to socioeconomics, whether it's due to their lifestyle, whether it's due to their you know, physical inability to go somewhere, right? And so uh, now telehealth has given them uh, a platform to communicate uh, with providers, with physicians, with support structures. I, I think it's gonna expand, quite frankly. I, I haven't heard or seen uh, telehealth being used or leveraged as much on the administrative side of things, but I think it's going to. I, I feel it's going to, right? Because there's still, um, there's still stuff lost in translation when, when somebody sends you a paper bill and it's like four pages long and you don't have to understand. Uh, and then, you know, getting someone on the phone is great, but, but for me personally, you know, like we're talking now mm -hmm. in person would be better. You know, hey, let's go over this piece of paper, but you know, through, through some uh, virtual platform or telehealth, which I think is a part of the whole thing. I, I think that could be approved upon as well, but, um, Telehealth has been shown, I, I don't think, I think slowly, and, and I thought there was a new release. I was going to talk to you about that later. Mm -hmm. uh, I think CMS has extended, uh, I think, coverage for uh, the, the current services all the way to 2023. I think ultimately, once the data continues to flush through, it, it's, it's not going to go anywhere, I, at least. And, and I think it's going to be a, a part of the healthcare delivery system. I still do, however, don't view it as uh, it's a piece of the delivery system. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll ever be, you know, the only mechanism to deliver healthcare. And I think mm -hmm. that's what people worry about when they hear telehealth. They're like, oh my God, 
I'll never get to see my doctor again. It's like, no, that's absolutely not true. You right. know, that's a, that's a misconception. I think that's put out there, or, you know, people who worry about that happening. I don't think that'll ever happen. Yeah. Yeah. You raise a great point. I mean, where I see it as a, as a complementary asset, yep. so let's take, for example, uh, behavioral health. So I'm sure you know, many of your, your uh, medical staff have patients who have behavioral health needs and people like the opportunity to see a, a therapist when they want it and yeah. in the format in which they want it. And then something like telehealth, if it's easy to access, they could talk to their therapist from the privacy of their home, the comfort of their home. I would think something like that would be very beneficial to the patient, like you said, to the provider, the primary care provider, as well as to the insurance company. Yeah, I think um, having the the opportunity or the choice of of how you want that interaction to occur for behavioral health mm -hmm. is is really important. I mean, it, some people absolutely are like, no, it has to be face to face. Other people, quite frankly, may want to start with a telehealth visit. Um, I've even heard, you know, the companies are flexible enough. It's like, you know, is it okay if I don't do video and just talk to you? It's like, yeah, that's okay too. You mm -hmm. know, wh whatever the comfort level to engage um, individuals in that. And, and I think it could be a broad spectrum, uh, whether it's temporary and transitional, whether people are going through uh, a, a loss and a tough time uh, and they never need behavioral services again. Uh, Having telehealth to, to be a, an easy access format to have someone to talk to, get them through, you know, a tough period in time. Uh, and then averse, of course, the, the more chronic conditions, uh, having regular constant feedback that's easily accessible, I think is important. And I think telehealth uh, fills that need rather well. Right, right. You know, John, you're, I give you a lot of credit, you and your team, a lot of credit. You're really changing the landscape in the way healthcare is being delivered, the focus on value, the focus on the independent community physician and what's important to them, as well as what's important to their patient. And I really appreciate you being on the show. You, know, you really have broken it down very nicely in terms of the vision of Hanaho Medical Group, where you're going, why, the, uh, what's the mission of the organization. And it's just really great work. And, you know, congratulations on your progress so far, and I know it's going to do very well in the years to come. Mahalo, and thank you for being on. Hey, thank you for having me, Vikram. It, it was fun. It was, <laughs> and you were right. The 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 time passed in the blink of an eye, but yeah. I re really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, hopefully, this message gets out a little bit more, uh, and we really are um, trying to support uh, not only doctors but the the communities in whole as well. Thank you very much. Absolutely. We have much more to unpack in future episodes with you. So we'll pick it up again soon. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Vikram. Mahalo. Thanks, John. Mahalo. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.